two billion people want to work but lack access. If you want to build middle classes and you want to build strong economies, you have to help people get jobs. These regions, the poverty rates are extremely high. We're talking about countries where the average income is between two and three dollars a day. We have to keep a relentless focus on job creation. So many problems from sex trafficking to infant mortality are fundamentally rooted in poverty and lack of access to dignified work. It also seems like a, just an impossible thing to get around. How could you ever overcome it when there aren't any opportunities? It is called Impact Sourcing, a unique model that brings tech jobs to women and youth in impoverished communities around the world. Some of the biggest tech companies in the world are using this as clients. Samasource founder and CEO. Lila Jana. She started Samasource. It connects companies such as Google and eBay with digitally skilled workers. I just love this idea. Talk to me about how it works. We are a different kind of technology company. We build tools to connect the world's poorest people using a concept that we invented called micro work. Through the internet, we can now tap the world's greatest underutilized resource with the brain power of the bottom four billion people. We're making it possible for people like refugees and women in rural parts of Pakistan to access those types of work. Sama Group is a family of social enterprises with a common mission to ensure that all human beings can afford to live with dignity. Technological progress means nothing if it doesn't equate to human progress. Sama means equal in Sanskrit, and our mission is to give work rather than handouts. Work is at the core of human dignity. It's how we define ourselves. It's how we make our contribution in the world. A living wage transforms lives. So I don't have half of that pictures in my album. I still have to get Bill Clinton. Oh, no. OK, uh, fair enough. <laughs> so Samasource, I'm just going to ask you in your own words. We heard a little bit there. What is Samasource in your own words? Sure. Uh, so I run an organization called Sama Group, and we have two programs, Samasource and Sama School. Sama means equal in Sanskrit. And uh, Sama Source is a program I started eight years ago to connect very low-income people, mostly in East Africa, South Asia, and we have a small program in Haiti, to work over the internet. So we break down big technology projects, uh, many of them for large companies, including Google, Walmart.com, Microsoft, TripAdvisor, and other tech companies. We break down these big data projects into small units of work. We call it micro work. And then we train people who come from very low income backgrounds to do this work from local computer labs. So it's uh, for us a way to move people out of poverty. So about micro work in those cases, for instance, what, what is it? Can you give us an example? Like data entry would be sure. one? Sure. Actually, one example. Uh, how many of you have heard of self-driving cars? I assume everyone here. Self-driving cars, okay. anyone? <laughs> I so, mean, I'm not sure they would work in Lebanon because they don't, you know, honk automatically and they don't overtake randomly. That would have to be added to the software. Sorry. You it's scary enough yeah. to drive your car, let alone turn it over <laughs> to an algorithm here. Uh, but, uh, but the way that those algorithms are developed is by capturing a lot of training data. So you need humans to tag what's happening inside images. Uh, for example, to tell us this is a lane line, this is a curb, this is someone's foot, stop the car. Uh, and so we provide a lot of the data behind those kinds of algorithms. And we actually provide that data to some car companies and some of the, the talk you're hearing about self-driving cars is coming out of data that is processed in East Africa at our centers. I had no idea. I've heard, for instance, that Tesla now has this lane recognition. So you have people like, oh, wow, this is really impressive. So this is an example. So you're teaching people from really poor areas to have these very, I'm sorry to use the term, low skills, because that's an entry point to a path, I guess, right? Is that yes. your idea as well? It's, uh, we think of it like the virtual assembly line. Right? Uh, in the prior era, we had physical assembly lines to manufacture all of our items. Well, now we have those same assembly lines, but they're virtual. So this is really entry-level work. This is like joining an assembly line for the first time. And if you're someone who lives on less than $2 a day in a slum in Kenya or Uganda or India, this kind of work is so much better than the informal economy where most of our workers are coming from. We've actually moved 30,000 people from about $2 a day to over $8 a day through this model, which in the countries where we work is considered middle income, and it's a huge improvement in quality of life. Is that what you call that impact sources? I remember it says impact sources versus outsourcing, right? Is that you try to, because outsourcing has been existing forever, but this time you try to actually make, a, I would, 
say, a moral stance in sourcing? Can I say that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we think of impact sourcing as using your existing supply chain and your existing budget to uh, move people out of poverty or to address another social issue. For example, in the US, we have a big problem with people coming back from war, veterans who are unemployed, and uh, some of them even become homeless and we don't really take care of them. We could create an impact sourcing model where you build your business with that kind of talent um, and really view those people as a source of talent and opportunity as opposed to people who you need to uh, give a handout to. So now I'm going to break it to the both the entry point, both on entry points, sorry. Do you do any work in the region, for instance, because we are here in Lebanon. Is there any of your work has been done in the MENA region, for instance, or North Africa, maybe, I don't know. We've been asked, in fact, we were just asked by, uh, by Morocco to see if we could implement one of our programs there. And I am so excited about the potential for micro work and impact sourcing to make a positive difference uh, with the refugee crisis and, and some of the migrant issues we've seen across Europe and, of course, across North Africa. We just did a pilot in a refugee camp in Kenya where I visited uh, several years ago and we actually had to shut it down then because there was, unfortunately, an attack on aid workers and we had to move our, our staff out of there. Now they've increased security, and we just did a pilot showing that refugees from the Dadaab refugee camp, which is just on the border of Kenya and Somalia, can do this work from local computer labs inside the camp. Now imagine what this could do for all of the millions of people now who've been forced from their homes uh, due to conflict, uh, due to you know, other political issues, who can now, maybe for the first time, do work through the internet. And there's still a lot of regulatory issues with that. Refugees are actually not allowed to work in many countries. But imagine if they could work uh, rather than in local jobs uh, through the internet for companies far away on the other side of the world. It would, it would dramatically open up the possibilities for those migrants. When you say through the internet, does it mean that sometimes you have to either only focus on region we have some kind of a connectivity or can you help them install some type of connectivity? Uh, so connectivity is still the, the biggest issue for us. Um, we still have millions and millions of people around the world who lack access even to electricity, forget the internet. Yeah, um, <laughs> but, uh, but there are many people who have much more money and resources than we do who are trying to connect everyone. So we're kind of riding that wave of global connectivity. Uh, in some areas, like in northern Uganda, where we have a center that has employed over 400 people, we've actually worked to set up the infrastructure. So uh, northern Uganda just got fiber optic connectivity a couple of years ago. In fact, uh, back then you could travel the country and you could actually see these giant spools of red cable that were fiber optic cable that were actually rolling out literally rolling out, not like rolling out as we say in tech, but literally rolling out across the country and providing high-speed internet. So we, um, we were able to tap into that and to build a local Wi-Fi network uh, that goes up to 300 miles. It's a focused Wi-Fi technology that can connect the surrounding villages to our main hub. And through that model and uh, we even set up the internet inside these little shipping containers with solar panels on the roof. Through that model, we've been able to get decent connectivity there. And we have workers in that area who are now working for TripAdvisor and Getty Images, among other clients. So it's, uh, it's possible with not so much investment to connect people. So now if I go to the other side, so the, actually your clients, I guess, uh, although you're a nonprofit, so forgive me for using the term clients, you mentioned mostly tech companies are the, the names. Is that what you're focusing on, especially by design or? Any company that has a big data problem, which is virtually every company today, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, could use Samus or services. Most of our clients are in technology, but we do have universities, um, uh, libraries, groups that have large data problems. In fact, one of our new sets of customers that we're targeting is governments. Imagine how cool it would be if governments and large NGOs that have already a social mission to serve the population could use impact sourcing to process their own data. There was, for example, in Kenya recently, a big project around digitizing all of the court records to come out of the Kenyan courts and convert them from paper records into digital assets. So imagine if you could do that using your own population and lifting people out of poverty at the same time. Our technology theoretically would enable that, and so we're, we're now in conversation with a couple of different governments about licensing our technology and setting up a Sama source like model at home. And your clients are all over the world, or are you, because you're based in the US, meaning 
if there was a company in the region that would like to use your services, is it possible for them? Is it open yet or they are, you're rolling out in phases? Absolutely. If, if you'd like to use our services, you can go to samagroup.co uh, or samasource.org and find us. And my email is just lila, L-E-I-L-A, -L -A, at uh, samagroup.co. So send me an email if you'd like to use our services. But before, I, I will open the floor for questions, but before I want to mention another project that was, I wasn't aware of before meeting you today, so my apologies, Sama School. Can you tell us a little bit more? Because it's connected, but it's a bit different. Yes. So uh, Sama Source is our work program. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to take it everywhere that I'd like to take it because uh, we have to set up infrastructure and hire workers. And it's, it's quite an intensive business. So we have about 700 workers now full time at Sama Source. And we decided to take the training that we developed for those workers and open it up and make it free to everyone. So if you go to samaschool.org, you can find our training. And this is the training that we think would be useful to prepare people to do this work in places like refugee camps or other areas where it might be difficult to get a large group of people working for a client today. So it's a free training program for 21st century digital jobs. The kinds of skills that we teach include uh, how to create a profile and market yourself on all of these new platforms for online work. The biggest one is called Upwork. And most people don't know this, but Upwork has paid over a billion dollars to contractors since, uh, since it started as two different websites about a decade ago. So you can now make money doing data entry, doing coding if you have those types of skills, even doing pretty basic tasks for anyone around the world through a site like Upwork. And what we found is that most low-income people are totally unaware that this opportunity exists. Governments are not yet teaching people about these 21st century jobs. So I'm going to open the floor to questions. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hands as usual. Oh, I see already two hands. So uh, someone could actually bring a microphone to the gentleman over there. There was someone else over there. Whilst they reach you, you your organization, I mean, your vision of how you do this is very, basically, it's the smallest unit of labor, which also comes into a larger discussion that it's been going on a lot in the past at least two, three years, which is the future of work, the future of labor. How do we see labor? Not only for us, will we have a career? Look at my LinkedIn. I don't have any career. It doesn't make sense. Uh, but how will, how will this evolve? So how is, what is your view on that? Do you think that a lot of the jobs will be divided in micro jobs and micro work, as you call them? This is, a, this is possibly the biggest question of our time. If you're a policymaker, um, you know, you're obviously thinking about this. And I just came from Stockholm where I spoke at the Nobel Week uh, about the future of work with some Nobel laureates who are much smarter than me. And thankfully, you'll be happy to know that uh, not many of them are so worried as I have been. <laughs> so uh, we all think that the, uh, the singularity, the point at which computers will totally take over and do all of our work is far, far away. Um, so far away, in fact, that we can't really design much policy for it. And if we look at the next 10 years, yes, we do see a threat to automation. Um, we see jobs going away in, in fields like, for example, driving. Um, 10 million drivers who will work for Uber and Lyft and car sharing companies uh, will, or uh, sorry. Yeah, you know, those, exactly those types yeah, of apps, yeah, yeah. They, will, they will go away because of self-driving cars. That said, there is at the same time an explosion in other sectors of the economy, like the care economy. It's going to be a long time before we would trust a robot to take care of our child or our elderly parent. And so uh, between now and the time when computers really take over, there are a lot of jobs that only humans can do. And in terms of um, making the jobs smaller, what we're seeing is actually the gig economy allows people to have a lot more flexibility in how they work. Uh, so many of the websites I mentioned, like Upwork, allow people to make more money by hour than they would make doing a traditional low-end, say, retail job. And as long as they're good at marketing themselves, uh, they can make a, a decent living through these platforms. Um, that said, we have to, again, we have to train people uh, on how to market themselves. Many people aren't used to that. So, uh, the first question, yep, yeah, please. Yes, hello, I'm Hadi Nahas. I'd like to ask you about the Syrian refugee issue. Are you planning or already in negotiation with anyone in the region to provide your services to the Syrian refugees? So, we've been uh, talking with CARE, which is a global humanitarian organization. I, I'm also on the board of it, and CARE is a large nonprofit that works in many refugee communities, and CARE manages camps uh, for Syrian refugees in Jordan and Turkey. 
So we have been talking to them about offering our training through them. It's really hard as a smaller organization to work directly with refugees without going through some kind of an intermediary. So uh, if you have suggestions, we would love to hear them. And I, I know our team is in discussions as well with the International Trade Center and uh, a few other organizations like that. So if I understand correctly, you, you participate with uh, NGOs and governments. Is there any role for private sector to play into that area? Absolutely. Uh, well, the, the best thing that the private sector could do is A, provide work, uh, and B, help us lobby to change laws in areas that we, where we might need to, where it's illegal for refugees to work. For example, in Kenya now, one of our biggest obstacles is that uh, technically refugees are not allowed to have work permits. Even if we are employing hundreds of Kenyan nationals uh, for lots of reasons, the government doesn't want us to directly employ refugees. So we've had to, we've had to try to identify workarounds. Some of the NGOs have, uh, have, have collaborated with the government to set up a different program where refugees are able to do day work and get paid as day laborers, essentially. And, uh, and that kind of skirts some of those rules. But I would say the private sector has those two roles to play. And the third thing would be, of course, to support this with financing, because uh, many of the organizations working in this space are really underfinanced to tackle the problem as large as, as it is. All right, the last question. So uh, do you think that uh, you can still cooperate in Syria now, given that the situation is still uh, not clear? Probably not in Syria. Uh, in fact, definitely not in Syria. I also have a responsibility to our staff to make sure I don't put anyone in danger. But I do think there's an opportunity to work with Syrian migrants in, in the places that they, that they go. And most of them, as you all know, will stay in the region and not go to Europe. So our concern is how do we make sure we provide job opportunities for people locally where they happen to be now? There was a person at the back over there, and then, yes, and, do, and then you. So please already provide a microphone here in front, please, in the fourth row, but please. Hi, I'm Colette. I just wanted to know, is there any potential for career uh, advancement amongst these positions, or is it just entry level? Uh, so with Sama Source, we actually see uh, the majority of our workers, after about a year, move on to either higher paying work outside of Sama Source or higher education. So it's really a stepping stone. It's, it's a bridge into the formal economy. If you're someone who's worked only in the informal sector, a lot of our workers, for example, uh, grow up in slums, and they do things like recycling. So they'll pick up pieces of scrap metal, they'll sell it to the local recycler, or they might be selling things in a local shop. Those types of jobs offer zero opportunities for advancement. And so we're, we're simply getting people into the, to the most basic work we can find that, that, that they can do efficiently. And, uh, and then quite quickly, they move out of that. So we have workers who end up taking jobs at banks and at other formal employers in, in the cities. And when they're in an area that, that doesn't have those types of jobs, we see them go into the online work sector, where you can grow your wages as much as 60% in the first year. So on a platform like Upwork, we see a huge jump. As soon as people start doing work and start getting good feedback from their clients, their, their uh, wages tend to rise really dramatically. And in fact, it's much more dramatic, that increase, than what you would see doing uh, any kind of local job. Thank you. Please. Um, hi, Leila. I'm Elsa from Extend Lebanon. We're a global social enterprise based in Paris. We're expanding now in Lebanon. So basically, we aim to accelerate social entrepreneurship in Lebanon. So I'm kind of interested to know more about how um, Sama Group is structured. How do you sustain yourself? Because I think it's very interesting to, very important to shed light on how uh, social enterprises sustain themselves. That's a great question. Uh, so I've had many people come up and ask me, so what do your parents do because they must be wealthy that uh, you're able to do this work? So my parents came from India with almost nothing when they came to the States in the late 70s. And I worked three jobs to get through college and have never really had much money to my name. So uh, I've been able to do what I do because luckily there are a number of organizations that fund nonprofits like ours were funded by uh, several major foundations. But we've also built an earned revenue model. So we actually make more sales revenue than a lot of businesses in our category in Silicon Valley. We are almost entirely now funded through earned revenue. And in about a year and a half, we'll be break even. 
um, based again on this earned revenue. And I think that's an incredibly important lesson for social entrepreneurs. You can build, in the US, you can build a nonprofit, and as long as your revenue is coming from uh, activities that further your social mission, in our case, our revenue comes from hiring these people to do uh, tasks for big companies, uh, then you can be a nonprofit. And for us, the the reason we're a nonprofit is that we never wanted to compromise on that social mission. We always wanted to make sure the workers we were bringing in were not middle class people who had college degrees, but people who genuinely came from backgrounds where they wouldn't normally get these jobs. Uh, and, and in terms of my recommendations for finding funding, I started Sama in 2008, and I was living on a friend's futon at the time, and I got $25,000 from a business plan competition in Amsterdam, of all places, and I got that money because I submitted the business plan on their website late one night. I had no idea that I would ever have the funds to start the business. So I'd say if you have an idea, get it out there, submit the business plan to as many competitions as you can find. And that $25,000 is what convinced me to quit my job and, and do this full time. So. That's actually impressive. Wow. I'm going to have time for one more question if somebody wants to pick it. Otherwise, we'll... There's some in the front. Oh, someone. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking the right direction. <laughs> Please, over there. Ap apologies for that. Thank you. Um, as much as I understand, what I understood is that you give job opportunities for people in Kenya. Are you, uh, is that uh, actually all over the world? All uh, over the yeah, world. yeah, in but East Africa, South Asia, and Haiti is but, where we have Sama but, source. But mm -hmm. those Kenyan uh, uh, workers, they work for American companies or for Kenyan companies? Global companies. Global. So and yeah. that doesn't affect the uh, unemployment rates in, let's say, the U.S. or Europe. That um, you're you're hiring people at lower wage and uh, they're not in that uh, country, does that affect the uh, unemployment and the, uh, the government's... Uh, this is a good question. So um, there's been a debate raging for the last decade on outsourcing and whether that's good or bad for the economy. Um, I believe that we now live in a global economy. When I, when I buy clothing in the US, it's never made in the US, it's made all over the world, right? And, and I'm a participant in that global economy simply by consuming something from even my neighborhood store. And uh, given that reality, almost all the companies that we work with have been outsourcing for a decade or more, mostly to for-profit outsourcing firms in India and China and the Philippines. Uh, so our mission is to enable low-income people to benefit from some of that existing outsourcing work, which hasn't been done in the US for quite a long time. Um, and I would say there, there is, uh, there's tremendous interest now in shopping local and in growing local economies, and I don't think the two are at all mutually exclusive. I think it's wonderful to support a local entrepreneur. In fact, we're starting to see a lot of instances of impact sourcing within the US. We have some clients who hire us both to do work overseas in fields like image tagging and to hire people in the US who might need to do uh, you know, phone screening. We have a lot of demand now for generating databases of information that's local. And you really need someone who has the local context to be able to make those phone calls and do that work. So I, I think actually, as the pie grows, there's going to be more opportunities both domestically and abroad, and we need to equip low-income people in both those areas to benefit from that growth. You know, that answer I would have, sadly, because I would have loved to listen to you even more. I mean, you'll be sticking around a bit, I think, so That's right. if anyone wants to reach out, should you give uh, them your email, so they have that already, but <laughs> she'll be around a little bit if you have any more questions. And please join me in applauding her because it was really Thank you. wonderful. Thank you very much, Thanks. Leila. Thank you.